Hello, everyone. Thanks for checking out this special episode of Really Dicey. This is Manny, and I am here with... I'm Jeremy. I am the, I'm actually a host on uh, the Fluff and Crunch podcast, and I am the author of the Aris fantasy role-playing game and uh, setting. And I've also done some other writing for Modiphius on top of that. But my main mm -hmm. focus here is, is the game we're going to talk about today. So I appreciate you having me on. Thank you. Yes, yes. And um, I'm, I'm glad to get to talk to you about this because I am still mourning the loss of Conan. Um, from, me too. You know, Modiphius had the license. And it's gone. And Conan was my um, doorway if I wanted to use the 2D20 system for a fantasy setting. Mm -hmm. And now it's gone. So when I heard about this, I was very intrigued and very glad to see a fantasy come back um, yeah. uh, through the, you know, using the 2D20 system. Mm -hmm. um, so let's start from the beginning. Where did the idea for this come from? Well, a number of years ago, I it wasn't that long actually after the fifth edition of a certain other fantasy role playing game came out. Uh, I started kicking around some ideas for what I thought of, and I don't, I actually don't remember the 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 origin of the idea, but I came up with I thought of this idea of what I called a rare magic setting. So a setting wherein magic was known, magic was powerful, but magic was not widely available. And I thought about it from the standpoint of like, what if, what if spell magic was, was, it was, was kind of like an oligarchy, like certain people had access to it. Certain people could control it. Nobody else could. And what would happen if that status quo started to be challenged by spell magic, say, creeping back in, like the people who aren't supposed to get it are starting to, it's starting to like ripple out into them. So I ran a short campaign using that that rule set, trying to do this, and it just didn't work. You know, it just I banging my head against the wall of the conceits mechanically of that system and the classes and things like that. And then a couple of years later, I, I thought I just I just couldn't let the idea go. And I had developed a little bit more of the, the story background to it, the idea of a, of a, a, a distant colony that is uh, far removed from its its you know, mother country. And these, this, this change is now starting. So the, the call it like the social fabric is starting to fray because this balance of who controls the magic and who doesn't is slowly starting to change. I tried a different system. I actually tried the fantasy age system thinking, you know, generic, it might be a little easier. And that, that didn't really work very well either. So I just let it sit. I mean, I, it just sat the idea and, uh, a year and some ago when 2D20 World Builders was announced, um, I got to thinking about, hey, wait a minute, why don't I use that and see if I can make it mechanically model and feel like what I had in my heart and mind as to how this setting would, would function and feel. So then last year, I, I wrote the whole thing. And then just recently, I spent the first couple of months of this year rewriting a, a significant amount of it and fleshing out the... Um, the, the, the world and the setting information and tweaking some of the rules to, to better fit that. So that's where it came from. For most people, when I talked about the 2D20 system, they take more of modern and sci-fi settings for it, uh, which is great and it works perfectly for it. Uh, but did you have any challenges trying to create the setting and using that rule system? You know, I didn't actually. And, and the, the reason why is, uh, you know, one of the earliest 2D20 games was Conan. You know, which sadly is out of print now. Um, you know, they lost the license last year. And, uh, you know, the, the, the Conan system definitely sits in the, in the like older, more crunchy version of 2D20 that they really don't do anymore. Like Infinity is the last game of that era of 2D20 that's still out there and, and still supported to, the, to whatever extent that it is. But the nice thing was is that I had in Conan something of a model of a, a, a game that provided a, a, what I thought was a nice balance between lots of action, like swinging from the rafters action, but also a grit and, and, um, and enough texture to combat. Like, you know, Conan, you, you've got displays. You can hack off an enemy's head and wave it at them and, and scare them and chase, you know, chase their buddies away. You can, there's a lot of different things. There's a lot of texture to Conan's combat system that I saw through that 2D20s, uh, it's, it's, it fits with that kind of, 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 uh, 
setting. And you're right. You know, most of the settings, most of the, the worlds that Modiphius is putting out now are modern or science fiction, things like that. But Conan provided a perfect example. And there were actually some things in Conan's rules, not necessarily like verbatim, but there were some things, a, a degree of grittiness and a degree of, of texture that is, and I don't say this is to disparage at all, because I, I love games like Star Trek Adventures and Octoon Cthulhu, but they are not in those versions. And so I wanted to weave some of those things back in. So actually, I found 2D20 and the flexibility of it and my ideas and some of the ideas that were in the SRD that was put out like over a year and a half ago now, I actually found it to be a really smooth fit. It I never felt like I was having to, to push against the system or beat it into submission to make it do what I what I wanted it to do. So let's talk a little bit more about the setting of Aris. Um, what 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 is what is going on here exactly? Okay. And actually you know what? Aris, 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 Aris. I, I actually mentioned that it is pronounced different ways depending on the like the linguistic norms of, of a region or an area or things like that. So I'm not saying there's only one way to say it. Um, mm. my sense is that it is a, from the Elven view, it is a mispronunciation, a perennial mispronunciation of a word from their high language that none of the other people can pronounce right anyway. Mm. So we can do as we wish with it. So, okay. So the, 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 the basic idea, the nutshell of the world is that elves, elder elves, especially wield massive, um, magic, you know, power spell power, skill with magic. And they they are essentially deathless. They live thousands upon thousands of years. Now think about this. If you put those two things together in one people and let them do their thing for a couple of thousand years, they would run everything. They would run everything from the background. You wouldn't even realize how much of the, the deck of your life had been stacked when you live 80 years. You know, you wouldn't even realize this because the elves are in the background managing everything. So what I did is I, I I took those two ideas and I thought like well what would that what would the elves do in relation to what I call the younger peoples, humans, uh, dwarves and halflings, um, and so the idea of Aris Aris is a continent that is far away from the home country the realm that the elves come from, and there are several colony areas on Aris and one of them is Linian. And that's actually the one that's that's pictured right here um, in the background that you put up. Linian is the main um, colony area where the Addis campaign starts or the world starts. So there's several of these colony areas that the elves set up a few centuries in the past. And they in that in that time period, something has drawn their attention back to their homelands. It's actually a war with dragons. And so they have turned, they slowly in their very, very slow. I mean, think about it. If you live thousands of years, the idea of making a decision in six months or five years would be like, why bother? You know, I, I could take 10 years to make that decision. That's how the elves are. So the elves have slowly turned their attention away from these colonies. And something is happening that is allowing or enabling magic, spell magic, to seep back in. And some of the people among the younger people, some humans, dwarves, half-elves, halflings, are beginning to be able to wield a um, like a dangerous and raw form of sp the spell magic that the elves master. So my question is, is the kind of question that sits at the, at the foundation of the, the world is what happens when this like political, social, cultural, economic, status quo that's older than anyone can possibly remember what happens when that starts to fray internally and if you know you're looking at this map here from outside of the map there are threats from outside of the map that in that elven magic has kept out like an overpressure as that starts to break down and the cohesion of society starts to to you know undergo tension and stress what happens so it's it's a it's a it's a place where your typical, I don't say, I, again, I don't say that to be negative, but like your typical kind of adventuring can take place. But then there's also this, um, this the unknown. There's a lot of unknown that goes around the colony and, um, and unknowns about like what's out there and what did the elves do to set up this colony? Those kinds of questions are out there. 
I I love the thought you put into this. In Rings of Power, um, for anyone that's watched that show, there's a scene that I like a lot where um, Elrond meets his uh, Doran friend. And his Doran friend is kind of annoyed with him that he doesn't visit very often. But to the elf who is long lived, like, oh, I, I just, you know, what, what do you mean? We just met recently. And a, and a dwarf says, like, we, it's been years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I've always thought that elves being so long lived would have such a huge effect politically, yeah. culturally, um, everything around it, because they, they're so long lived. At, at the age that I am right now, um, I think back about the last 20 or so years and think about like, well, if I had time to do this and have experience to know that, I would do a different life path and so forth. But if you're long lived, you could have all that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I've always thought that if, if elves live that long, they would be alien. They would be utterly alien to everybody else. And so that's what I set them up as in the game. They are, they are these odd, distant, aloof, almost alien things that um, they're at the top of, of every bureaucracy. They're at the top of every like city or air, you know, regional, you know, power structure. And, uh, and they, they run things from behind the scenes. But the problem is that the magic that they have that it has enabled them to do that is, is eroding. And so, you know, changes on the wind. Um, and so, I, like I said, I wanted to have this balance between like, if you wanted to have an like a, a more urban type of stories like you know a thieves guild or you know trying to figure out the secrets that are hidden in some archive or something like that you could do that if you wanted to have you know wretched goblins or something like that like you know raiding farms outside of town and you're the new local heroes well you could do that and if you wanted to go outside of the colony into these unknown lands where people had not been allowed to go then there's a whole like you know the 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 that kind of blank slate open uh open possibilities um, for what you might what you might end up doing but what I'm 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 trying to balance also between enough of a meta not a meta plot but a meta story so that um, GMs who want to run with that can do that but also ones who just hey I just want to do like exploration and I want to find caves and I want to fight you know have my players you know characters fight monsters and stuff that the 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 the, the weird sociopolitics can fade into the background it doesn't necessarily have to be in your face. Okay. So in a sense that there's enough there that if you want um, a setting right there and then, this book yes. has that available. But at the same time, if you just you want your typical, um, uh, uh, I'm trying to find another word for D&D. <laughs> but like a D&D. Yeah, &D no, you know, as my, like my podcasting buddy who's in England, he calls it like bog standard fantasy. If you want your bog <laughs> standard fantasy. Uh, then, then yeah, you can, you could do that. You could take the Aris, 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 whatever story and, and push it into the background. And at that point you have humans, halflings, dwarves, and half elves as playable. Elves are actually not a playable race because they are so alien. Um, but you've, you've got pretty much all the, all the bits and bobs that you would need to play a pretty typical fantasy, um, game. Okay. So anyone that's like a fan of, uh, some of the, the the basic stuff of yep. D and D, or like old school essentials, uh, yep. Shadow Dark, and wants to use the two D twenty system. This mm -hmm. book can serve that purpose. Yeah, and actually, I I kept that. I kept first edition, and and first edition AD and D in the back of my mind um, because that's where I started. You know, a bajillion years yeah. ago, and I thought like, wow, there are some terrific old modules. You know, there are some great. D, D basic and especially AD and D first edition. There are some terrific modules out there. I am I will go to the mat for this. Any of those could be easily translated into this system because of how character creation functions, because you know, combat is is pretty flexible, how the magic system functions and how monsters are handled. All of those things are um I guess to put it simply, are all rooted in systems that enable you to create your own instead of having long, long lists of stock content. So translating the Ghost Tower of Inverness or something like that into this, I actually think would be really easy for a GM who's who's interested in doing it and not particularly time consuming. So yeah, if you want to just dump at us completely, you could just use this to run good old D&D, &D, but using um, the 2D20 system, which 
I think offers a lot of possibilities that, you know, 40 year old rule sets just never anticipated. Like the degree of the, the degree of player agency through, um, uh, uh, the meta currencies and things like that, I think is a, is a, is really important and adds a lot to the game. Mm. So who can you be exactly in this game? Okay. So again, I said, uh, dwarf, halfling, half elf, human. By default in the Addis setting, those are the, the playable races, um, peoples, whatever you want to call them. Um, there's a, a loose life path system. So you choose your, your race and then you choose your family. That is the people around whom you, the people who are around you in your formative years. And there's, there are several options and those affect some of your initial, I mean, it, actually, if you're familiar with Star Trek Adventures, you're, you're familiar with Octon Cthulhu, how you, you move through this loose life path where you, you add points at each step. You add points to attributes, you add points to skills, you add some focuses. It's the exact same thing. I wanted to, I, I actually, I think that system works well and there was no reason to reinvent the wheel when that I think functions. So you race family and then uh, your, what I called your surroundings. In other words, you could potentially have a, you grew up in a merchant family but a merchant family that grows up on the frontier is going to have a different experience than a merchant family that grows up in a city. So then after you, you choose your surroundings, you choose uh, an archetype, which is essentially like a class. Academic, crafter, entertainer, explorer, merchant, outlaw, warrior. And each of those, going back to races, each race has certain stock uh, bonuses and, and inclinations and, and like special abilities. And then you choose one of four but are essentially talents that allow you to differentiate within the race a little bit. The archetype works the same way. So, for example, you would if you wanted to play an explorer, you would then you'd get some stock bonuses that had to do with being an explorer. But then you have you choose one of four options that that can differentiate what kind of explorer do you want to be, and then that gives you a talent that that helps you focus what what that character is going to look like. I didn't, these are tied well enough to the setting. They all fit within the setting fine, but they are all, in my mind, pretty archetypal examples of, you know, different kinds of fantasy characters. So again, I, I think that if you, if you had an idea like, hey, I'd like to play a, you know, like someone who grew up in a merchant family, but, but, but really gravitated toward being like more the caravan guard. Oh, and we grew up in, the, in a rural area because we were, you know, like kind of caravan merchants. I'm going to make a warrior. So that makes sense. Instead of it being this, you know, like classes work terrific, but they're so prescribed. You know, it's like, here's your everything pretty much. I wanted to make it a little bit more modular. So you would have, if you had an idea as to what kind of character you want to make, or if you were moving from another system and you just want another game and you wanted to use 2D20, what kind of a character type you wanted to model? I think the system's flexible enough to support that. Mm. For anyone that's used to playing D and D is and is looking at this and is curious about the magic system, and mm -hmm. of course D and D uses the the Vancian magic of yep. remembering spells and forgetting spells. Um, how would you describe the magic system and how it's used in this in this game? Okay, I. Uh... I gave myself a lot of gray hair uh, developing the the magic. <laughs> I mean, there were points at which I was like, no, I'm not going to do this. Forget about it. But then I, I was like, no, I started out to do I, I This was part of my personal charge. I'm going to keep with this. So there the magic system is built on the idea that you create your own spells. There are about 30 some odd spells in the book many of them very specifically described as to like, this is how I created the spell to, to help get people used to how the magic create the spell creation system works. But there aren't, I mean, if you look at the PHB for 5e, like a third or more of the book is just spells. There's nothing like that. Hmm. Um, like I said, there's like 30 some odd spells and those are really there just to get you started and mainly to, to show how you build spells using the system. In, in, in a nutshell, the spell construction system is a, is a point-based zero-sum system wherein you spend points to get the things you want, damage, range, effects, duration, things like that, and you, you, uh, you increase the spell casting cost 
and you increase the spell casting difficulty to gain points to do that. Um, it is it, the, the spell system at the table functions very much like Octung Cthulhu with one significant difference. And when I say very much like Octung Cthulhu, I mean you roll as if you are take, doing a skill test. So you, based on, uh, you have a skill and you have a, uh, uh, rather, you have your governing attribute depending on what kind of caster you are. And then depending on the nature of the spell, you would use one of your six skills. And that's what you're rolling. You then have a, there's a special stress track called Essence, which is essentially like magic points. You don't, you don't necessarily take damage like in Octon Cthulhu. You just, you might have 10 Essence or 11 Essence and maybe a spell costs five Essence to cost or to spend. You might have like a, an Essence track of 10 and a, one of your spells costs five. So you just spent half your points and you regenerate that essence like stress in the 2d20 norm, which means after an adequate rest, after an action scene, you get your stress back. So I so I don't have spell slots. I don't have mm -hmm. Vankian magic where you suddenly forget these things. Um, you and it's not like Octum Cthulhu where you're, you know, you get a nosebleed each time you you cast a spell. You have a you have a basically like a wallet of spell money and each spell costs a certain amount and you just spend it as you cast. I was about to ask you about um, uh, the 2D. So in each Modifius book, whenever they use the 2D20 system, there's a, there's a bit of variation in the rules here and there. Yep. Um, um, does this do a, do a variation of sorts of its own, the 2D20 system? I've got a couple of things that I, the magic system is the big one. The magic system is entirely um, novel. Otherwise, for the most part, I'd say it's more tweaks. Uh, there are things that I, I looked back to Conan for. Like, for example, remember in Conan, when you, just, when, when you took a reaction in combat, if you decided to oppose, you had to give the GM threat. I brought that back. Because mm -hmm. I figure if, if you're in melee, you're trying to defend yourself. And if you decide I'm going to try to stab this guy because he's trying to stab at me, that you know that kind of breaks your breaks your flow a little bit, and so you're going to give the GM some threat. There there are some tweaks. Um, that that's one of them. You know, giving the giving the GM threat for uh, for reactions. I also change the relationship, or rather, I change the way that focuses work a little bit. So you have you have a skill, you have an attribute. That's two d twenty normal to add together to make a target number. Okay. I took, I have six attributes and I have six skills. So it's kind of like Star Trek adventures. The skills are very broad in nature. You choose focuses like Star Trek adventures. That is you make up your own. The focuses are not tied to one skill. They float between the skills as makes sense in the moment, like Star Trek adventures. So they're not nested under the skills like Octone Cthulhu. They just float around as needed, but focuses have ratings like, like they did in Conan. So, for example, you might have a brawn of eight, and you might have a fight skill of two. So your target number is 10, but you have a focus in melee weapons of two. Now your target number is 12. Now, the focuses, by, having, by adding um, a score to focuses, there are a couple of things I'm, I'm happy with how this works out. First off, you I mean, we all know that when you roll a one, that's a critical success. In Aris, when you roll at or beneath your focus plus your skill, that is a critical success. So by putting points into focuses, I'm able to quantify a little bit just how likely you are to get a critical success when you have a focus in play. I mm. like how focuses float in Star Trek Adventures. Like your, your knowledge of weapons might be useful in a museum or when you're trying to beat someone over the head with a bat left, you know. Mm. So I wanted that, that possibility. Also, and this is something coming back to magic a little bit, the experience point system, the experience system rather, focuses are really inexpensive compared to skills. Skills are more expensive because they are broader in nature. They cover a lot more terrain than a, than a narrow focus. So focuses are easier to increase. Skills are, are more expensive, but, um, but focuses go, our skills go a little bit higher. The other thing that I did that, again, is a novel piece of the magic system is that when you build a spell, unlike your typical D&D, &D, where, I mean, let's face it, like, you know, when you're low level, you have magic missile. 
And then nowadays you can just add more dice as you go up and level. But everyone waits until fifth level when they can get Fireball. And then Fireball does a bunch of stuff. Okay. I'm not a big fan of disposable everything. So the experience system or through the experience system, you can use experience points to go back to a spell you built and change it and add to it and improve it. So if you build a spell, when you start out as a character, if you have spells, they're going to be pretty weak. They're probably going to be pretty weak or they're going to be really expensive to cast. But over time, you can reduce the cost to cast. You can increase the duration. You can increase the range. You could add more effects. You could take some kind of like fire, you know, fire beam and turn it, add the area effect and then add more. And then, you know, you can, I like the idea of, hey, I made this spell. I'm a spellcaster. I've worked on this spell. I've used it a bunch of times. I figured out how to channel through my mind to, to make it hit multiple people or last longer when I levitate off the ground. So why not make the spell, instead of just having all these spells that you just pick new ones and then discard the old ones or never use them, why not enable you to continually grow, modify, customize, as well as add new, new spells? Mm. So that was a, that was another thing. Um, I mean, really, when it comes to the system, it's uh, the the core rules are are pretty much two d twenty standard. Like if you took Octung, Star Trek Adventures, and Conan, and put those together, that's pretty much where I, I'd say that's probably ninety percent of the rules in terms of how they function with a couple of these tweaks and innovations here and there, and then combinations of things that exist in separate systems, like the idea of giving the GM threat for reactions that don't exist in all of them that I've, that I put together. And this book is complete. You, it's not like D D and D what is a player's guide and DMGs. Uh, this is a complete everything. It is. It's 268 pages. That's covered, including the covers in the back, you know, like that stuff, the index, um, I got about 80 some odd monsters and a, um, a whole system whereby you can create monsters. So the whole idea is you have all these different kinds of monster special abilities, special attacks, special traits. Um, you know, in 2D20, you've got minor NPCs, noteworthy NPCs, major NPCs. I added an epic NPC because like, what's the difference between a, I mean, a dragon and a 60 foot tall giant as compared to, you know what I mean? There's, there's, mm. there's a level of scale and just like potential damage that can come from something like that. I added Epic as another NPC type, but um, yeah, there's a full system for creating monsters and a selection of about 80 some. Uh, there's about, about 14, 15% of the book is just setting content. Um, and another thing also that I didn't mention about character creation is talents. Um, talents you also create. Uh, there's one 2D20 game, John Carter or Mars, where you create your own talents. And I was really taken by that. I really thought that I, I like the idea of I've got this idea for a character instead of I must order off the menu. I have to buy off the shelf. I provided a system whereby you create, you have a point-based system to create talents where essentially you're, you're a one point talent stands in for what a one point momentum spend would be. And so once you understand how the momentum economy works, building talents is really easy. And there are a bunch of sample talents in there. And I explained how I created them too. So people can, you know, people can go ahead and, 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 and model what they want. Mm. And I see also there's a an adventure toward yeah. the back. You have to have those, I think at least. Uh, yeah, there's there's just a short adventure in a in a teeny tiny little town where things go things go really sideways, very quickly, uh, mm. and uh, and you're the only you know you're the coin flip heroes. You're the one you're the ones the the mayor decided to tap to go solve the town's problem. And the the main point of that was just to to give people an opportunity. And I I try to talk folks through it to use some of the major um, systems, the most obvious ones like combat and, and task resolution, um, but to use some of the other systems to show how, how it can be, uh, how flexible the game can be. How does the game handle momentum, threat? Does it have uh, fortune points like it does yeah. in the other 2D20 systems? Yeah, I went with fortune instead of determination. You know, the idea that it's a pure meta currency and it is, fortune does what fortune does in, um, Octon Cthulhu. It's it's like the super momentum that's owned by the player. 
Uh, momentum functions like in all the other games. Uh, it's gained in the same manner. Uh, I stuck with the the modern uh, buying an extra D uh, D20 is one point for the first, two points for the second, three points for the third, unlike Conan where it was a flat one per, and then you have this pile of D20s. Um, I tweaked some of the costs, a handful of the costs, like what does it cost to roll um, to re-roll your challenge dice, or what does it cost to disarm some things like that. A, a handful of the, the price tags for the momentum spends are are different, but otherwise it's the same. And this was this was a balance I tried to strike. I really I, there were some things that I thought were important system wise to tweak between, like I said. If I took Oct if you took Octung, Star Trek, and Conan and put them together, that's that's where most of this comes from, aside from the novel content. Um, and I didn't have a problem with those. I didn't they didn't think there was a reason to reinvent the wheel. The the glaring hole in Modiphius's catalog is big fantasy. Hmm. You know, like sword swinging, awesome fantasy. That that's what's missing it. And that's what I wanted to make. And there were plenty of things in the 2D20 games and through the SRD that I thought they worked just fine. Um, and, and, and it sounds like also the conversion for this is easy. So what I mean by that is that I could have a, a play a Star Trek game and it could be a, a time travel space uh, collapsing type of episode where sure, uh, the, holiday. Crew, yes, your crew goes back into a fantasy setting. And I think the, the rules tend to work well together yeah actually you know what if you weren't too it's kind of funny that you mentioned that if you weren't too worried about like being simulationist um you could just take a star trek adventures character and, and run it in this i mean the one the 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 question would be how are you going to handle wounds um and injuries because i do have two two separate stress tracks i have a physical and i have a mental i decided to split those like like conan had because there are some, you know, spells and other effects that clearly are mental, not physical. Um, but yeah, the, everything everything works the same way. The core mechanic is is exactly the same as in any two D twenty system. And you mentioned that earlier. I think that's one of the lovely things about two D twenty is that it's this common core mechanic, but it can be expressed. the The trappings around it can be expressed so many different ways that you have these. I mean, let's face it, Dune feels radically different than Conan, but it's the same core mechanic. What is the future? For this for this uh, setting for this book, do you see? Are you thinking about possibly more source books in the future? Do you think maybe this is it for now? What are your What are your plans? Well, I hope there's. I, I hope I am spurred to action by a positive response to. It. I mean, it's been out for almost a year. It's been out for about ten months, and then I just released the the this remastered version, which is really the version I wanted. Um, and uh, I. I just yesterday, actually, well, here, I don't know when this is going to drop. So I recently, how's that? Mm -hmm. I just recently put out a pay what you want version that is the core rules and the action and combat chapter. Plus the the, the pre-gens. Because I just wanted to do like, hey, take a look at, take a look at what I did with it. What, what could you do with fantasy with 2D20? Uh, but my hope is to write, I want to write a couple of adventures. I want to write a, like a really not um, not typical because that sounds so bad. But I want to write like a, a a a good like exploration out on the fringes of the wilds type adventure. And then I also want to write like an urban adventure because I want to spotlight some of the story of like the weird elven overlords. So I want to work on those, time permitting. And then I'm also going to put out a couple of um, free and you know pay what you want type of resources that are here. Here's a bunch of talents. And here are a bunch of spells just just to show the the mileage that people can get out of the game. Here are some more examples of these two flexible systems, the talent creation and the spell creation systems being put to use. And frankly, what I will do with both of those is I will probably sit down with a uh, D and D three three point oh or three point five book and convert a bunch of feats just for kicks to show what can be done. And I will more than likely do something similar to that with spells. Where where can someone um, find this? Okay, you can get it on drive through. So if you go to drive through, the easiest way, and I'll, I'll send you links so that if you want to include those. But the easiest way to get there is just go to drive throughs homepage, click Publishers, click Modiphius, and you have to look around for the 2D20 World Builders logo because if you have the dark 
mode interface on, it's black lettering on a black screen. So you have to search around a little bit among their, their list of titles. But if you click that, the, um, the, the full game is there. And then, like I said, this, this very recent release of a pay what you want for the, um, for the core rules chapter and the uh, action and conflict chapter and the pre-gens, pre-generated characters that come with the game, that one is, is there as well. And the game's only $4.99. You know, hmm. and I also hyperlinked it throughout. So the, the every page has a link back to the table of contents and a link to the, the index, which is then fully linked throughout the whole book by by topic. So I tried to make the PDF easy to navigate. Hmm. I'll put those links in the description below. Cool. Is there anything else about this that I haven't asked you about that you wanted to share? Anyway? You know, I, I think that if you're a player or a GM who wants who, who likes 2D20, first off. That, that's obviously the low-hanging fruit. If you like 2D20 and you like fantasy, and you're interested in the idea of ordering off the menu, that is, I want to create my own kinds of feats or talents or whatever they're called in a given game, and I want to create my own monsters, and I want to create my own spells, that's baked into this. It, I, I'm not, I don't just provide the system and then you know throw you in the deep end and say, figure it out. I provide a ton of examples for all of those, but if that interests you, or if you're reading some book or you've seen some movie and you're like, there's not a game for that. I'm confident that you can use those systems to model those things and create it yourself and have it function within 2D20. And then you don't have to write your own game. Mm. Do, do you think we'll see a, a print on demand version for this sometimes? You know, currently, uh, Modifius does not allow print on demand through drive through for the 2D20's world, 2D20 world builders program. So there's certain limitations that they put on creators who use their system through the world builders program. And one of them thus far has been that we, we can't do physical products. I would love to do a physical product. That'd be terrific. I'd love to have one for myself, but at this point we're, um, we're actually prohibited from doing that. Uh, well, let's hope that changed sometime soon. Cause I would love yeah, to have this like in my bookshelf over here. Um, but I guess, Jeremy, thank you so much for talking to us about Aris, Fantasy Role Playing Game and Setting, Remastered Edition. And again, I'll put the links in the description below. Um, viewers, thank you for watching. Stay safe out there. We'll see you next time. Thanks so much, Manny. I appreciate it.